96 uh, meeting of the Planning Board to order. Uh, first item on this evening's agenda, and welcome you all, of course. Uh, first evening on tonight's agenda is uh, minutes of the previous meeting. Any comments, corrections, questions? Mr. Edsel? Mr. Chair, I'll move that we uh, accept the minutes as drafted. Second. Second. All those in favor, indicate by raising your right hand. Motion approved. Minutes are approved. Thank you, Alice. We have um, many items of correspondence on uh, this evening's agenda. I will just simply, uh, for the sake of time and because of a full agenda, uh, list them individually. We have a letter from the Code Enforcement Officer regarding interpretations for the Cantor Lane project. Uh, we have a letter regarding uh, the Highlands pro uh, subdivision from uh, Stephen Moore, representing the uh, owner. We have a letter from Chief McGoldrick regarding the December workshop. We have a memorandum from, I'm sorry, a letter to the Chief McGoldrick regarding the December workshop. Uh, the Planning Board, as you may or may not know, enjoyed and learned a lot from uh, touring various uh, dead-end streets around town with the Chief in, in the new ladder truck. It was uh, very instructive for all of us, and we appreciate the time uh, and effort that it took to uh, do that. We have a memorandum uh, from the Planning Board uh, to the Zork Committee. We have a report of the Planning Board activities for 1995, and perhaps once again, contrary to popular belief, most projects that come before the Planning Board, although they are thoroughly scrutinized, do receive approval. Uh, we have uh, information regarding uh, major land use laws seminar. And we have a memorandum to Gerald uh, Daigle uh, regarding performance guarantees, uh, shoreland zoning news for the fall of 1995, environmental and developmental newsletter for November, December of 1995, uh, information regarding zoning news, November 1995. We have a traveling and growing smart newsletter uh, for the winter of 95. We have a dial a I better say this carefully, uh, BMP card, best management practices, probably will put all of our civil engineers out of business <coughs> or get them all in business. Alternative mode study newsletter for November of 1995, uh, revised zoning map. A letter from uh, Susie Terrian regarding Dominica's uh, Crossing, a, a project that's uh, last on this evening's <coughs> agenda under new business. Uh, there are comments in that that uh, uh, reflect uh, uh, the chair and also there's a comment in there with respect to the status of review during the workshop which I don't believe uh, is accurate and uh, when that item comes on the agenda I'd like to have an opportunity to address that letter before we get into any review of completeness. Uh, we have a memorandum from the Public Works Director regarding uh, Dominicus Crossing, a memorandum from Chief McGoldrick regarding Cantor Lane, and as you all know, we have an update of the subdivision ordinance. In addition, before us this evening uh, at the uh, table, we have a letter uh, addressed to uh, myself from Samuel W. Van Dam and Rick Renner regarding uh, Dominicus Crossing, uh, written on behalf of uh, the abutter Susie Terrian. In addition, we have a letter from the town attorney uh, regarding the Cantor Lane property. The letter is to uh, Ernie McVeigh, code enforcement officer. With that, the uh, next item on this evening's agenda is uh, election of new offices. Uh, before we delve into that, I would like to take this opportunity after almost two years of uh, having uh, been faithfully supported by the planning board uh, and, and completing my, term, my uh, second year term as uh, chairman. Uh, thank you all for the many hours and hard work uh, that has uh, made this job a lot easier. I particularly would like to thank Maureen O'Meara, the town planner, uh, one candidate uh, for uh, uh, chairmanship uh, asked me how much time it takes to commit uh, as chairman. I said it takes a considerable amount of time but certainly far less time than it would take without the uh, capable abilities of Maureen O'Meara. And I certainly would like to thank uh, Alice Allen, our, our uh, Planning Board Secretary, for the many hours that she puts in uh, putting together our, our meeting, meeting notes. Thank you, Alice. And again, thank you all board members. I think a real tribute to this board is their 
a very high level of attendance at all workshops and all planning board meetings is a very strong commitment by all board members that uh, they serve both the public as, as well as the um, uh, people coming before the board uh, well in a, a good spirit of customer service. We're thorough, but uh, I believe we're a very fair board. With that, let's uh, move on to uh, election of uh, officers. Do I see a nomination for chair? Mr. Edsel. Mr. Chair, I'd like to uh, nominate Steve Parkhurst uh, for chair. Steve's been a very diligent and faithful uh, member of the board for some time. And uh, very knowledgeable. I, I think he deserves to be uh, chair for the upcoming year. Very good. Any other nominations? With that, uh, we have uh, just vote. All those in favor? Steve is elected unanimously. Congratulations. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, the uh, second uh, position to be elected is that of vice chair or co uh, vice chair, not co-chair. Uh, do I hear a nomination? For Vice Chair, Mark. Mr. Chair, uh, I would like to place uh, Janet McKay as uh, a nominee for Vice Chair, uh, especially in view of her demonstrated abilities in coming to grips with all of the various types of complicated materials we deal with and in an extraordinarily insightful manner. Terrific. Any other? Seeing none, all those in favor? Passes unanimously. Congratulations, Ms. McKay. Thank you, Mr. Emery. And I'd like to take this uh, opportunity, if I may, to, on behalf of all of the members of the planning board and the staff, uh, thank Tom for his very able leadership as, as chair of the planning board. I was thinking about what uh, we all wanted to say about you. I would say that you are extremely knowledgeable about land use issues, that you are a very able communicator, that you deal fairly in both procedural and substantive manners, and that last but not least, you have a very fine sense of humor. Well, thank it's you. been a distinct pleasure to serve under your leadership. I'm proudest of the uh, last one. Thank you very <laughs> much. <clears throat> well, I'm going to sit down just for a second just before I excuse myself for the first um, item on the agenda. So, Janet, would you please? <laughs> Next item on the agenda is the Highland Subdivision Amendments. Um, Maureen, do you want to bring us up to speed on this one? Um, at the um, excuse me, Madam Chair. Ah, uh, beg your pardon. Before uh, we get into this, I've recently changed positions from Tarion Architects to Land Use Consultants, although Land Use Consultants has not been involved from the beginning on this project. They are now involved in a minor uh, engineering matter with respect to this uh, project in consultation with Steve Moore, so I will have to uh, recuse myself as well. Thank you, Mr. Emery. At the November meeting, the board had scheduled a public hearing on amendments to the Highland subdivision. The applicant asked at that time that the uh, item be tabled because there were residents in attendance who may not be available for the December meeting. The board held the public hearing and left it open. Uh, in December, the applicant again requested to be tabled and therefore there was no reason for the board to meet in December. Um, this is the next time you've met since November, and the, board, the applicant has again asked that the item be tabled to give him time to revise the plans and make them consistent. Any questions? Through the plan, I'd ask, uh, when did this first come in as an application? This particular amendment? Right. I guess there are two key pieces of information. How long it's been an application, number two, is November the first time that they asked for uh, an extension 
for it, for it to be tabled. So we're November, December. Yeah, this is the third extension. Um, I'm technically it's the second extension because you didn't extend them for December. You just didn't meet at all. Um, oh, that's right. okay. My in, in a quick review of my notes, it's it's looking like they made a submission for um, the October meeting, and that's when they first came back. The application. Um, was scheduled for a public hearing in November, and um, then the, the series of tablings occurred. Mr. Kyle? Okay. Uh, yes, Chair. Um, in reference to Mr. Moore's letter of December 29th, in the first paragraph, he mentions an anticipated time of review to secure public sewers to sewer the phase two area of the project. Has that come up a discussion before about a sewer connection? No, this was the first time. There were some brief discussions um, between the applicant and the town about a complete reconfiguration of phase two, um, which would have essentially been starting over. Um, the applicant chose not to pursue that. Well, how does that now position the, the original application? They, they can continue with their existing uh, application before the board, which is for an amendment to a previously approved subdivision. Thank you. Is there any limitation under the current ordinance, Maureen, with respect to how long we can table applications for amendments to subdivision? There's, there's the only limit that you have is um, tabling something after a point that the applicant has demanded a decision. And obviously the applicant has not at that point. Because you're in the previously approved category um, and you've, you've left the public hearing open, um, you don't really have the problem yet of feeling the clock ticking. I mean, you're, you're usually limited to making a decision within 60 days of deeming an application complete. Um, but since the public hearing is still open, I would think for the next meeting, it would be a good idea to, to confirm exactly what kind of timeline you're on. At any point, you, you can decide that um, you've had enough time with this application and, and you want to make a decision on it. Is there any consensus in the board that we might like to suggest that the applicant uh, either come before us the next time or else be subject to a... Uh, with all of the request for a turn down? I'm sure. Uh, uh, historically, we, we've allowed um, applicants to run longer. I, I think the issue really is if, if it seems apparent to us that th these extensions are for no other reason than either they simply can't get it together or they're trying to wait out some other decision by another zoning board or, or the council or whatever. And then it's, it's, it's futile. We, we might as well just say, hey, Call it quits. You want to come back? I'm fine. Um, we've certainly run well over six months. Sometimes I think I put a one year uh, with one. I don't advise the board do that again. But uh, we're relatively short period of time now. And I think uh, you know um, with the history of this this application that, that, that we should give some consideration to to going forward. I, I, just as a note, I was looking at, at our rules. Um, we left the, the public hearing open, and, and we're cer we certainly can. We could make that step to close the public hearing. If that causes a technical problem tonight, we could close that hearing. We have the chair has the the ability. Uh, look under public meetings number three. The chair may reopen a pu closed public hearing with the consent of the majority of the planning board. So we could reopen at any time. And, and uh, we left it open last time, thinking that we had to leave it. Uh, I don't know if that's a step that the planner might advise us to take or not. Well, under under these. If you remember, the applicant is coming forward for two different reviews, an amendment to a previously approved subdivision and a wetlands alteration permit. Uh, the subdivision portion uh, is, is sufficiently broad, so you're, you're not really held to certain deadlines on that. But on the wetlands alteration permit, you do have deadlines. And you are required within 35 days following a public hearing um, or such longer period as may mutually be agreeable to the planning board and the applicant. So. You've, you've covered yourself both ways. I see no reason to close the public hearing right now. Thank you. Because the language of the interpretation <laughs> we follow the close of the public, 35 days following the close of the public hearing. Right. I, I think we're, if we were to close it, it could be construed that we're trying to 
shut the door on somebody. That's not the intent. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? Do I hear a motion? Is it Yes. Madam Chair. Mr. Edson. A uh, motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the request of the applicant, the Highland subdivision amendments, including relocation of the water line, be tabled to the regular February 20th, 1996 meeting of the planning board, at which time the public hearing may shall be continued. Do I hear a second? Second. Further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Thank you. Passed unanimously. Next item on the, on the agenda is um, bluestone quarry earth materials removal permit. Request by Leland P. Murray for an annual renewal of an earth materials removal permit for the quarry located at 1019 Sawyer Road, section 19-3-8, public hearing. Is the applicant here? Hi, I'm, Le <coughs> I'm Leland Murray, um, the son of the applicant. I'm here to answer any questions you might have. We'll open up the board. Does the board have any questions for the applicant? Mr. Yeah. Um, last year, I, I don't think you were here. I think your dad was here. Um, it was an issue with us at the time that, as a matter of housekeeping, that, that the the plan which has been penciled each year right. uh, that when you come back this year that it be done drafted professionally and, and I don't see that that has been done is there some reason why um, the applicant uh, chose not to have it done professionally? It was um, my understanding it was just a, a question of uh, cost this year and he's kind of looking at doing it next year we had discussed that I do believe Maureen can um, quote me if I'm wrong, he has talked to the town manager on it and uh, it was his understanding it would be all right for this year. I'd ask through the planner, um, have you had discussions with the plan of the applicant regarding uh, not having this? Yes, I, I had extensive discussions with the applicant regarding lack of uh, an updated survey. I made it clear that I thought it was something the board had asked for. Um, he made it clear he was not going to do it. Um, and he did have a conversation with the manager, which is my understanding, where there was some conversation about the board being able to waive the survey requirement. Did you, uh, excuse me. Go ahead. It's also my recollection that we uh, were requiring a, that we agreed to waive the requirement of the survey last year with the understanding that it would be presented this year. Do the minutes of the approval the last time around reflect anything in particular? Would you like to remind us of what we yes, decided? I, I, I checked the minutes and I, I checked the approval letter and, and it, it did say that you had gone on for a number of years amending the same plan and it was time to um, update it and I did have a conversation with uh, Jim Sr. and he, he remembered that as well and, uh, he just felt that it was an unnecessary cost and I don't want to put words in Jim's mouth. But. No, no, I, I agree with you. Hmm. Mr. Chair, um, <clears throat> is it and perhaps as a question for the planner again, is it within the authority of the planning board to grant an extension of the 1995 permit for X amount of time to allow the, the applicant, without issuing a 1996 permit to, to extend um, for a period of time? Does it, do we have that authority to extend it? I, I don't want the board to be uh, in the position of um, being criticized for um, inhibiting somebody's business. At the same time, there's a level of, of 
professionalism that, that requires this, this board is, is, is responsible for uh, approving it based that, that blasting hasn't taken place within X number of feet of the, the boundaries and so forth. We're basing that over the last four or five years on simply a penciled in area. Uh, do we have the authority to extend last year's permit for, uh, for a conditional period of time that will allow him to have it done? It's, it's my understanding what you're looking for is to extend the permit for, say, a month or two to give the applicant time to revise the plan. I'd be willing to, to extend it for up to six months mm -hmm. of uh, uh, an extension to, to give the, person, uh, the applicant a reasonable amount of time to, uh, to get this done. I mean, this is not the most favorable time to do survey work. Uh, especially in a quarry, um, and uh, uh, but I, I think it's something that, that it's the responsibility of the board to, to uh, as a matter of enforced housekeeping. I guess I would like to uh, underscore what Mr. Edsel has to say. I don't think that there is any. Um, I mean, I, I think this issue, to the best of my recollection, was explored rather fully with your father a year yeah, ago. I'm just here because he can't be. Sure. No, no, no. All, all I'm saying is that we're not trying to spring something like right. at the last minute. That no, no. we indicated he last year that. that we had been lenient for several years prior to that and that we gave him essentially 12 months notice that right. when he came back, this is what we were going to be um, looking for and really discussed quite seriously the reasons why. So um, I guess I, for one, have not changed the opinion that I expressed this time last yeah. year, which was that I thought the last year was the last year we ought to be operating without a survey. And I would be willing to extend uh, to something like 60 days, but it seems to me that six months is not appropriate under the circumstances since this applicant's already had a year notice to start with. I guess it a matter of discussion, then, then I, you know, I, I would, 60 days does not, th this time of year doesn't give somebody a, a great deal of time to, to perform the surveying work, I, I don't no, think. I, uh, I was over there today, as a matter of fact, getting ready to move a back out on a different job, and there's just no way they could do yeah. the survey. I, I, it it could be snow. dangerous yeah. to be moving around the, the yeah. quarry at this time of year. Mm. Um, and, and I want to stress, you know, my, my reason for bringing this up is not to try to inhibit somebody's business. It's just we need to cure this is part of an approval. If, 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 if we don't have to be serious about what we approve, then it doesn't need to come here for a permit, I don't think. Um, if we are, then it's a matter of housekeeping that needs to be taken care of. Um, I w even as much as is to extend to for six months and then have the natural uh, annual renewal go from June to June or whatever. Uh, otherwise, we're asking the applicant to, uh, additional submission fees. I'd like to see it go from June to June. That way he'd be here every year. <laughs> <laughs> I get it now. To, to answer uh, Mr. Etzel's question, that the ordinance does require that the board um, can issue a permit for a period not to exceed one year, which means you could issue a permit for a shorter period of time. Question for the applicant. Do you know if this would have any adverse uh, effect on your insurance policy for the operation for the quarry? Not that I'm aware of. We really don't plan to do much over there this winter because it's, it's so bad that we can't even work over there. It's too dangerous with that much snow and ice up on the top that we don't really plan on doing much work there this winter at all. So if you extended it, nothing's going to happen between now and spring. Okay, so you won't be doing any work there at all until the snow is gone? Not unless we get a nice January thaw. Okay, is there any other comments from the board? Okay. Mr. Parkhurst, I have one other comment, and that's with respect to the insurance. Um, I've noticed that there's a new insurance certificate that's attached, and the coverages are certainly adequate. I think they... Um, mirror what we had talked about last year, but my concern is the language on the cancellation notice down in the bottom right-hand corner, that the uh, 
issuing company will endeavor to mail 10-day written notice, um, we should require a minimum of 30 days for a cancellation notice, and we should um, that there's particular language which doesn't have to be typed in like this, that the um, uh, failure to mail the notice shall impose no obligation or liability of any kind on the company. Uh, the whole point of requiring the 30-day notice of cancellation is that the town receives the notice in adequate time to require the applicant to get <coughs> additional insurance. It's the same sort of language that um, mortgage lenders require. So I would like to ask the applicant to provide a 30-day notice of cancellation uh, in the same format that is required by local banks. <coughs> and I guess I'd also like the other comment that I have is that in the letter from the applicant dated December the 18th, 1995, uh, he indicates in the fourth paragraph that they've removed 950 cubic yards of stone this year about and plan to continue operation throughout 1995. I think he means 1996. Yes. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments from the board? Uh, I'd, I'd just like to pick up on two of the uh, town engineer's comments. One is that he's noted that the excavation appears to be within the 100-foot setback, uh, perhaps as close as 35 feet, and he's suggesting that the plan be revised. Uh, I wouldn't yeah. suggest that the plan just be revised to show something greater than 100 I feet. I know, so one side of the road and the other side of the old quarry, so happened. we won't touch either one. And uh, he's also addressed the issue of topography with respect to a quarry practice. And it's ironic, but we just had this discussion in the office today about how hard it is to map uh, ledge. It's, it always grows greater than what anyone anticipates. Right. Um, and it would seem to be reasonable to have topographic uh, spot elevations on the major blast areas, but not necessarily to have a total contour map of all the ledge uh, extraction. <clears throat> Any other questions or comments? We still have to have a, a public hearing on this. Mm -hmm. With that, um, I open the public hearing. Does anyone, members of the board, or excuse me, members of the public wish to speak on this item? Seeing none, close the public hearing. Um, Any further discussion or a motion? Just, just to note that uh, I think I've been on the board now about five years, maybe longer, uh, and I don't believe that we've ever had a comment at this pu uh, public hearing at this item. I think that speaks a lot about the uh, because it's in a fairly crowded area, that it speaks a lot about uh, the applicant's uh, diligence in, in running this quarry. I, I know you don't own, own all the houses across the street and within uh, 2,000 feet up and down the streets. Do we have a motion? Mr. Chairman, I have a motion for the board to consider the applicant, uh, the findings of fact. Oh, no. Do I have to go through the findings of fact? <laughs> the app, number one, the applicant operates Bluestone Quarry located at 1019 Sawyer Road. Number two, this facility requires a special permit to remove earth materials under section 19-3-8. Number three, the facility will conduct blasting and transport operations which could endanger the public health, safety, and welfare. Number four, the applicant has substantially addressed the requirements needed for issuance of a special permit for removal of earth materials. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the, applicant, the application of Leland Murray for a special permit for removal of earth materials at the Bluestone Quarry located at 1019 Sawyer Road be granted by the planning board for a six-month period. 
beginning January the 16th, 1996, and ending with the regular July 1996 meeting of the Planning Board, subject to the following conditions. Number one, the applicant shall keep accurate records of any and all blasting operations, including times and dates of such operations, and information on size and placement of all charges. All blasting shall be performed by or under the direct personal supervision of a person qualified, experienced, and regularly engaged in such work and shall be done in a manner which shall not endanger the health or safety of any person or damage any real or personal property on or off the quarry site. Representatives of the applicant shall be present at the time of the blasting operation. Number three, the applicant shall maintain comprehensive general public liability insurance with coverage not less than 500,000 per person and per occurrence for bodily injury or death and not less than 100,000 per occurrence for property damage. Number four, the schedule for any blasting and drilling shall be submitted by the applicant to the public safety dispatcher at least seven days prior to the commencement of the work. The schedule shall include the name of the drilling and or blasting subcontractor who will perform the work and a certificate of insurance for such, 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 such subcontracting. The schedule shall be approved by the building inspector prior to the commencement of the work. Drilling and blasting shall be scheduled for no more than one half day at a time. Five, no operations shall be conducted at the quarry on Saturdays, Sundays, or holidays, except that stone may be loaded and trucked from the site on Saturdays. Six, no machinery or equipment shall be operated before 8 a.m. or after 6 p.m. on any day, except that loading of trucks shall take place only between 7.30 a.m. and 4.30 p.m. Seven, fencing and appropriate signs shall be maintained. The applicant shall maintain at least 12 signs, three on each side of the property, reading danger, no trespassing. Eight, the applicant shall make a reasonable attempt to notify Cape Elizabeth residents along Sawyer Road and Stillman Street in the vicinity of the quarry prior to any blasting operation. Nine, no more than 10,000 cubic yards of material shall be removed during the term of this permit. Ten, if the building inspector finds at any time that the health, safety, or welfare of area residents or property is threatened by quarry operations, she or he is authorized and directed to order that all work on the site be suspended immediately and to require that operations be resumed only after further action by the planning board. Do I hear a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise the right hand. Do <clears throat> we have any further discussion? None here. I, I would just ask that, that the intent here for limiting to six months um, uh, was to get complete plans, and then I wasn't listening to every. Did you mention? I didn't ch change anything else, but I I would. Might amend it to add that the requirement for ah, very July good idea. 1996 be that uh, professionally drawn survey? I don't, well, I don't know the right. I, I'm not sure that that's actually an amendment to this approval or perhaps a, an indication if the motion passes that uh, under no circumstances whatsoever will the board consider an application that does not have a uh, surveyor's plan, which is what we said the last time. I guess I'll leave it to the consensus of the board. The only question I have is, is, uh, is the 10,000 cubic yards a statutory limit for annual basis? 10,000 cubic yards is a number we've been using. Um, a couple of years ago, I, I was in uh, hot water with Mr. Murray because DEP called and they were going to make him go through another level of review if he removes more than 1,000 cubic yards. So I think it was last year I suggest we limit it to 1,000 since he never pulls that much out anyway and he wants it left at 10,000. Fine. I would like to I'd like to uh, make paragraph number 11 to the um, motion be uh, that the permit will be uh, will not be renewed under any circumstances without uh, the submission of a uh, survey by a licensed surveyor of the entire parcel. We have a second to the amendment. Yep, that's fine. Okay, any further discussion? No. All those in favor, please raise the right hand. You want to ask for those opposed? Those opposed. Thank you. Thank you.
And just for the record, I oppose it because this applicant has already had 12 months to do this. <coughs> Next item on the agenda is uh, the Cantor Lane Project, requested by Shorewoods Incorporated, Sangamon Associates Incorporated, and Cantor Corporation for wetlands alteration permit and public access waiver for three lots U23-3-2, 3-4, and 3-3, located off of Cantor Lane, section 19-3-9. Wetland alteration permit and public access waiver for the wetland completeness in section 19-4-2B, public access waiver. And due to a, a conflict, um, this one I have to step down for this one as well. Would you like to start? Sure. <coughs> my name is, <coughs> excuse me. My name is John Mitchell, Mitchell and Associates, and I represent uh, three applicants uh, for this project. The first is Sagamon Associates, <coughs> the owner of Lot One. The second is Cantor Corp, the owner of Lot Four, and the third is Sherwoods Inc., the owner of Lot Five. <coughs> Uh, the applicants are requesting approval for three items in this project. <clears throat> the first is a wetland special uh, permit for crossing RP2, <coughs> RP2 wetlands for the construction of a access drive. Uh, the second is a public access waiver uh, to provide access to lots four and five, and the third is approval of a wetland restoration plan for a pond on lot two that was created uh, during the spring of 1995. Uh, before I get into the proposals, I'd like to uh, just briefly describe some of the characteristics of, uh, of Cantor Lane. The overall parcel is 41.89 acres. Um, and it lies in the residential A zone district. It is bounded on the north by Hunt Club Woods, or land owned by Hunt, Hunt Club Woods Association. Uh, on the north, east and north by land owned by Timothy Robinson. <coughs> on the south by land owned by Charles Haywood. The Cape Elizabeth Methodist Church is located at the corner, uh, adjacent to Ocean House Road. And on the west by uh, two residential properties and of course Ocean House Road uh, of which there are frontage in the lower section of the, uh, the Cantor Lane parcel and a short amount of frontage where the existing Cantor Lane uh, intersects Ocean House Road. <coughs> uh, the land was divided uh, by the previous owner back in 86 into five uh, residential lots. At that time, uh, there were two of the lots, lots two and three, were built on, have single family residences. Um, Cantor Lane, uh, the existing Cantor Lane comes off at uh, Ocean House Road at the intersection of Hillway uh, and extends approximately 1,200 feet uh, and provides access to lot two and lot three. <coughs> Uh, there are two existing ponds on either side of Cantor Lane. Uh, the, the land generally slopes in a northerly direction. Uh, the more gentle, moderate slopes are uh, in the northern half of the property. 
The steepest slopes exist uh, primarily on lot one. There are some very steep slopes and ledge outcrops uh, on the southern side of the proposed access drive. Uh, the wetlands were delineated <coughs> and mapped by Woodlot Alternatives uh, last summer. Uh, generally, there is a large area of wetland uh, which lies on lot one and three. A couple ribbons of wetland that sort of bisect uh, lot, lots four and five. There are small, two small isolated wetlands on, uh, on either side of Cantor Lane at the bend. And Woodlot uh, identified a, a shallow depression in the uh, corner of Lot 5, uh, which they've categorized as a vernal pool. Uh, soils were formed by Albert Frick Associates, uh, a detailed investigation of soils to identify uh, on-site disposal sites. Uh, and he found a number of uh, uh, suitable sites on the three lots. Uh, the vegetation is uh, this essentially is is very uh, wooded, very much wooded, uh, with a good mix of birch and red maple and pine and hemlock. Uh, all in all, it's it's really a spectacular piece of property. And uh, as you will see as we, as we go through our presentation, one of the goals, a uh, very imp important goal. Uh, in planning this land is to preserve uh, the character and the beauty of, of the landscape. Uh, okay, the proposal, uh, as I mentioned, the first is the uh, wet spe wetland special permit for crossing RP2 wetlands. Uh, the present con configuration of Lot 5 includes a 40-foot wide narrow strip of land uh, which extends from uh, the larger part of lot, lot 5 out to Cantor Lane, and this was to provide access uh, to that lot. However, this is the area where the, the more sensitive wetlands are in the lower elevations of the wetland, and uh, therefore we have proposed the access drive to be located in the upper elevations uh, near the wetland upland edge. Uh, and this was done obviously to minimize the impact on, on the wetlands. Uh, it was also done to avoid uh, the steeper slopes uh, which exist in this area here, uh, the ledge outcrops, and also to provide a reasonable building envelope uh, for lot one to develop in. We are asking for two waivers uh, of the special permit. Uh, the first is, they're both from the requirement, to the submission requirements. Uh, the first is from the requirement of providing a high intensity soil survey. Um, and as we indicated in our application, uh, Woodlot Alternatives in there delineating the wetlands provided uh, what they call Army Corps data sheets, which uh, document the, uh, in a very detailed fashion, the hydric soils um, and the extent of, um, it, it documents the soil conditions and the extent of the hydric soils and uh, provides very detailed information on the soils. Therefore, we're asking for a waiver on the high intensity soil survey. The second is a waiver on the requirement to provide a detailed stormwater report. Um, in, sec in Exhibit 8 of our application, there is a letter report from BH2M who did an assessment of the drainage conditions on site and uh, basically stated that there would be minor impacts, if any, associated with the construction of this roadway. And I believe the, uh, the town engineer supported that. Uh, the next item is, I don't believe, is, is a waiver request because it's not on the list of, uh, the list of uh, submission requirements. However, it, it was listed as an item, item A in Maureen's uh, comments, and that is to provide HHE 200 forms. Uh, we have provided, I believe, uh, 
adequate information on soils uh, to demonstrate that there is uh, on-site disposal, suitable on-site disposal sites for each of the three lots. Um, and that's found in, <coughs> uh, that's found in Exhibit 13 of the application. The second request is for a public access waiver. Uh, because lot one and lot five do not have the required frontage uh, on a public way, we are required to have <coughs> to obtain a public access waiver. We are uh, requesting one waiver of the standards of that section, uh, and that is the uh, requesting a waiver to reduce the, the width of the roadway. Uh, I believe public access standards require 22 feet. We are requesting a width of 12 feet. Um, it would be a 12-foot paved access way with one-foot grass shoulders on, on either side. Uh, and again, this is the request is we, we are we're trying to minimize the disturbance uh, within the wetlands, uh, and we're trying to preserve the character of, of this residential neighborhood. <coughs> the, uh, the third request is for approval of a wetland restoration plan for this pond, which was constructed during the spring of 95, uh, and <coughs> found in uh, exhibit 12 of our application, uh, we have followed the, the requirement, submission requirements under section 19-3-9-11 of the ordinance uh, and have addressed each one of the uh, submission requirements for the uh, restoration plan. And it's also included on uh, sheet two in a more uh, in large detail. With that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Or <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, at this point, I'd like to ask Maureen to um, give us a review because I think the first order of business before us is the issue of completeness. Um, the board is not required to make a finding of completeness for a public access waiver application, but it is required to do that for a wetlands alteration permit. There is a wetlands alteration permit application completeness checklist in, in your package, and I'm just going to go down that quickly because there are some things in here that need to be uh, changed. I uh, missed some items in the package submitted by the applicant. Um, as, as John noted, a complete HHE 200 form has not been submitted. Uh, typically, that's what the board has used as a baseline submission requirement. Uh, but they have submitted some soils data that suggests that there's probably a suitable site for a septic system on the lots that are proposed to be built on. Under item B, uh, a topographic map, the applicant has submitted that, and, and in my opinion, that application, that portion of the application is complete, and it's on page two. Uh, under F, the written description of a high intensity soils map, uh, the applicant has, re has um, requested a waiver of that. They have submitted a significant amount of information on soils anyway, as well as a deep <coughs> uh, assessment of wetland plants, and they've used the wetland plants assessment to determine where the wetland boundary is. Uh, the town engineer under item H has uh, noted that some of the water courses don't have directional indications on them. Uh, under item I, uh, as John noted, a waiver of the stormwater port has been requested and, and the town engineer concurs with the request. Um, under J, uh, the ordinance does require a building footprint. Uh, the board, however, it's been your custom to have a building envelope instead of a building footprint. It's proven to be much more flexible in terms of the post-approval process. Uh, under K, uh, I've indicated that that's incomplete and that's incorrect. The applicant has provided information on cubic yards of fill and the estimated area to be altered. And again, and that's on page two. Um, on, on the restoration plan on M, there is a detailed 
planting plan with planting lists for the area around the pond that's been submitted. However, there was also a suggestion in the application that there would be plantings to mitigate the location of the roadway, and that, that portion of the application um, I couldn't find. Uh, the evidence of DEP and Army Corps permits, I uh, traded phone calls with uh, a staff person from the DEP today, and I wasn't able to contact him. But I'm assuming that there, that's sufficient evidence that the permits are being uh, sought. Um, and finally, under P, uh, because I had some concerns because there's so, there's so much interrelation between different lots and the access that they need to get to the certain sites. Also, that Cantor Lane did not seem to be on one particular lot, but meanders across several lots. I received a letter from Dennis Keeler today, which I can forward to the board, which shows that when the lots were created, they were created with cross easements. So all the existing lots have legal rights to Cantor Lane, and the applicant has submitted information in the package. It's, it's, it's not specific at this point, but that, that proposes conveying the additional rights you need to get to lots four and five when you relocate uh, that new access road. So there has been additional information submitted on item P as well. Are there any questions? The, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. The issue with respect to topography, if I'm reading this map correctly, we have a five-foot contour interval. The second page has one of those. I'm looking at from the standpoint of the lots and the uh, test pits. Uh, has the applicant is, is uh, requesting a waiver for uh, from soils as well as topo? No, we're not requesting a, uh, a waiver on topo. Even, even for the uh, lot sites where you show the uh, um, test pit locations? Well, if, if that is a requirement, then we would be requesting. Okay. Uh, my understanding was that it was a requirement of where we're going to construct the uh, uh, the public access waiver or the road access road. <clears throat> I'm I'm not sure that that's indeed the case because what we're talking about is a wetland alteration permit, and presumably there may be some activities, for example, uh, in lot four where the test pit. Uh, the area identified for uh, the location of the uh, one of the leach fields is within the 25-foot buffer. I, I just I have not for the development of this type. It just seems that a five-foot contour interval is. I we I mean I don't know what we have here in terms of 20% slopes. Whether we exceed that requirement, whether that has additional uh, resource protection requirements. It would seem to me that a two-foot contour interval would be. Either, either additional soils information or a two-foot contour interval, one or the other would be appropriate for the site. It's adjacent to developed properties and adjacent to a uh, uh, wetland buffer and, and Hunch Club wood. I would certainly uh, listen if the board had any other preference, but... Uh, two things. Number, number one, um, I just realized that I'm a trustee of the, uh, the Methodist Church, and, and I didn't <laughs> even think of it until I realized we're a, a, an abutter uh, to this property. Um, it didn't linger very heavily on my mind that that was a situation until uh, just now, so I'd, I prefer not to consider that a, a conflict of interest in any way um, or bias. It certainly wouldn't be a conflict. It would maybe a, a construed to be a bias. I don't personally see that. I'm willing to take any comment from the board. Does anybody have any comment? A trustee of, of a church looks after the physical lot and, and, and improvements. And, uh, I just happen to think of that as, as a trustee of an abutter. I have a sense that this issue would be more problematic in the church than it would be here at the planning board. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard of it as a, as a problem there. So. Fair, a fair <laughs> assessment. I think, I think I'd like to leave it if it's acceptable, both the applicant and the board members. If it arises as an issue, uh, I will notify the board. Um, and, and if I feel any sense of bias approaching, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I'll let everybody know. If, if anybody senses that, then, then please uh, bring that back up. I think that would be a fair way to handle it. 
made me forget my second. Oh, I know. My second <laughs> question was uh, key to the completeness issue for me, anyway, is to, is to know by by which list are we are we checking this off? And I'm looking at the wetlands restoration and creation 1939-11. Am I looking at the correct completeness checklist? By what by what list are we? Uh, be, it legally is important, I think, uh, according to. I would recommend that you use the wetlands alteration permit section, which is a couple of pages back from where you are. Dash O three B, Steve. Um, there's a section that talks about a wetlands alteration permit, and it talks about the procedures and the submission requirements, which would be on page. I'm sorry, three nine O three B nine. And O three B. Page sixty five. Thank you. All right. So the submission requirement, that is the checklist I, I, that the applicant went by. Yep. Yes. And the applicant's been and been referencing a, a, restor a restoration plan, I think to the applicant's credit, uh, because the, the the pond was dug without getting a special permit first. Uh, if you look at the the, per the permitted uses list, uh, it's 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 very conceivable that if the applicant had come to this board before digging the pond, they still could have gotten a permit. It's just, it's a little reversed. And so they're also addressing the, the, the section that talks about wetland restoration because it's a, something they did to a wetland without the proper permits and they're coming in after the fact. But I, I would still use the, the I, I agree. list. I, I agree. And I, the reason I bring that up is it's a reviewing a, a 1993 legal opinion from our the town's legal counsel regarding completeness and trying to keep us on track of what's completeness, what's qualitative, and, and it, it doesn't at that time refer to uh, wetlands alteration completeness, but it compares subdivision to site plan, and, and um, I guess I'm trying to interpret it, uh, what's correct and, and um, as to what's what's qualitative. In other words, if there's if there's a Article of submission here, in other words, there's something in the application, then, then we deem it complete. It's still, and, and according to this legal, so we can, uh, as it states here, allows the board to request additional information in the form of, and then goes on and lists them. Uh, but these comments would go toward the merits of the particular application uh, and not its completeness. Uh, I see that as being known as a, as a person who, who wants the HHE 200. There's no reason why not to have it. It's not an issue of completeness, but the applicant should, could, should know that that probably will come up as an issue of, of quality or qualitativeness, um, the requirement. As far as the, the one and two foot contours, um, I think common sense might drive us away that all of the wetlands may not need to be contoured to that degree. Five foot contours doesn't necessarily answer the questions we have, but in those areas of alteration, uh, localized to that, um, perhaps a two-foot contour would make it a lot easier uh, for us to take a look at it. Just a, a point of clarification on that. Uh, <clears throat> is it required, is it stated somewhere that one or two-foot contour intervals is required for assessing on-site disposal systems? I guess. You want to answer that? Go ahead. It's a requirement for a wetland special permit. Mm -hmm. And one of the other submission requirements for a special permit is the location of all utilities and, and subsurface disposal systems. And this board in the past has used the HHE 200 as the, the customary acceptable way to show where the septic system is going to be and that it's right. going to pass our town requirements. So you think they'll align the issue of that, and I'm missing a couple tabs. That's why I was having a hard time following. I'm missing tab 13, everything after 12. So I, I lost so your, your uh, lost place of where you, those things were. But I did see um, the test pit location. So there are two ingredients of the HHE 200. You know, the soil profiles are there, and the locations are there. Um, and I guess, in my own interpretation of that and completeness, it says the application applicant has stuff in this application, so that part of it's complete. We can go back to the applicant and say, we need more, if that's deemed what the, the board wants. Um, but as a matter of completeness, I don't, I don't think uh, um. Yeah, see, it's, it's, 
it's of my opinion and Albert Frick's opinion that uh, it's really not appropriate to to uh, provide the HHE 200 forms at this point in time for doing the level of planning that we're doing because we don't we can't anticipate where these are going to go I mean we don't know until the actual lot owner purchase, purchases one of these lots and cites their home um, where the septic system will be placed in relation to the home. He, we, are, we are telling you or demonstrating that there are a number of sites on each of these three lots that are suitable for on-site disposal system. It doesn't make sense to me to go through the final design of these disposal systems um, at this point in time. I, I think just as a compromise to that, and, and we're getting ahead of ourselves because, you know, I, at least from my opinion, that's not an issue of completeness, but it may be an issue of discussion. Um, there are times when the design is important. If we're at a grade and we don't have that when we only have a five-foot contour, um, if you are, for instance, right the, on the border or the boundary of, of one of the, your butters, can you actually design a system there? What does that system look like? And then that's a crucial piece of information. What we have has, shows what the, the soil's profiles are. In other words, what dictates type of system and so forth. Number two, you show where it is on the face of the earth. Fully understand it may not end up there. It just says, yes, this lot can have one here or here or just there. Uh, there are times when the design is important, depending on, on the slope and so forth. But I think that comes later in this process and not right now. Any other comments? No. Um. Well, let's, uh, why don't we just move down the um, checklist point by point and see where we are with respect to each of the issues, if that's uh, acceptable. With respect to A, the detailed site plan, what is the board's feeling about whether um, we are going to require at this point a complete uh, HHE 200 form for each building envelope? Steve has made his point clear that uh, he thinks that the amount of information that has been, don't let me speak for you, Steve, but the amount of information um, that has been provided <coughs> is satisfactory with respect to a. Any other comments from board members? No. Nope. It's okay with you? Yes. Okay. Uh, B, Maureen has indicated is no problem. C, D, and E are okay. F, uh, the request for a waiver of high intensity soils. Now, Tom has indicated that. Uh, Oh, now, wait a minute, have I? No, it was I'm sorry, B, B is the one that is the request for a waiver. Tom has indicated that he would like to see us either have two-foot contours or uh, more extensive soils information. Let's back up to B and see whether the request for a waiver of the two-foot contours is acceptable to the board. I guess I'd like to give my reason uh, first. Uh, it's unusual that we have before us this evening a subdivision for which we, we don't have any review, uh, re uh, purview or requirement or whatever the correct term is. Uh, and I understand that and I accept that. Uh, what is before us is, in essence, a site plan and a wetland alteration <coughs> permit. And without two-foot contour intervals uh, or without going to the site, uh, I don't know that the board can make a fair interpretation of what one sees on the ground. Um, and I think this roadway alignment is very specific to the natural features that the applicant that uh, John Mitchell is speaking to. Uh, and I can't remember a site plan that's come before this board, and certainly not a subdivision plan that has had less than two foot contour interval information, particularly without additional soils mapping, high intensity soils mapping. So I, I, I think it would be consistent with what we generally require for this type of work, given the sensitive nature of this, this site with steep slopes with considerable wetlands, uh, that it would be consistent to require a two-foot contour interval, which generally can be uh, uh, from aerial photography or some existing survey information may be available. 
uh, that, that's generally an overview of when we get to review of the project, I think it will become more evident of what those concerns really are. Any other comments on B? A, a, a question of the time, and maybe I misunderstood what you said, but are, are you saying that, that you think there's a need for the two or not to waiver this, this requirement throughout the, the, the project, or are we talking just about the areas that will be on? I'm, I'm talking about lots one, five, and four. Is it possible uh, to request? We will provide the two-foot contours. That's that's no problem. It's going to be very difficult to do right now. It, I mean, it's next to impossible with the amount of snow coverage. Um, so that we can continue with the process, uh, we will provide that as soon as uh, weather conditions permit. But I would hate to be held up for a couple months because we can't get out there and do two-foot contours. That's the old question, Mr. Mitchell, about completeness, is if we deem something complete, then we move on. And if we deem something incomplete, then we cannot process the application until we get it complete. <coughs> now, we may need to have some more discussion about what we would accept as complete and, and incomplete. Um, and the the idea of trying to determine something is complete to start with is obviously to have the board have the minimum that it needs to proceed from here with the understanding that if we needed to request additional information over and above the minimum that we would be talking with you about that as as the process continued but um, anybody else have any thoughts on the um, B My sense is that if, if we were to wait, um, I certainly have a clear understanding of the issue with respect to weather. Um, well, I think we, uh, we all that, do. Uh, however, if we would defer that, I think it's, it's uh, the reason for even having it to start with probably uh, is no longer uh, evident. Um, there's, no, there's no existing aerial contour information that you well, can this whole survey was done by aerial with, uh, with field control. And, and there's no greater interpret interpolation than five foot interval? Well, um, not at this point in time. Um, it, just, it just seems for this board to be consistent and to have a, a consistent basis of information that if we're requiring uh, subdivisions of 200 plus acres and 100 plus acres to provide us with high intensity soil survey information in addition to two foot condor interval that it's no more, uh, perhaps even more appropriate to expect that information where we have uh, smaller parcels and, and perhaps more potential impact on abutting properties. I'll, I'll leave it at that. I, I just think uh, I'm willing to accept what we have in terms of completeness. When we get into a substantive review of the application, uh, I think there will be comments that I will have with respect to the road alignment and alternative road alignments that would head, take advantage of a two-foot contour interval um, map. So it may be as we, as we review the project, uh, uh, it may be necessary that uh, if that road is shifted that we have additional contour information to make uh, 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 decisions about the appropriate alignment. So you're asking for two foot contours of the entire? Lots one, four, and five. One, four, and five. One, four, and five. Let me just offer up a, a solution or, or a suggestion. Um, the issue is you can't get back out and, and refine that from five to two foot contour to the snow cover, weather, et cetera, um, for this size area. Uh, the, 
does that still mean, even if it were limited to the area of alteration, that you can't get out? And, uh, I suppose if you can't do a large area uh, yeah. due to snow cover, you can't do a, a I guess I misunderstood. Area. I thought that the one-foot contour requirement was for the wetlands special permit, which we're applying for for crossing the RP2 wetlands. And that we have provided. This is a one-foot contour interval through the entire area of where the road is going to be placed. I, I did not understand that we were required to have a one-foot or two-foot contour for individual lots. I don't think the requirement is for lots. I think it's for the, for the uh, property that the applicant is placing before the board for review and consideration. Where you put the road happens to be, I mean, it could be on the upland area, it could be in the wetland. Obviously, if, you, if it were in the upland area, you might not be here for a wetland alteration uh, application. Mr. Emery, if, what other areas would you be looking for two foot or one or one foot or two foot contour? In the subject My general sense is that we will have, uh, we will have house lots developed on these uh, three parcels. Obviously, I don't think there's any question about lot one is critical with respect to slope. Uh, I don't know that there's enough information to make an intelligent decision about where houses ought to be located, at least from the board standpoint, or septic systems on lots four and five. And I would think that the alignment of the road and, and possible building sites have something to do with one another. That, that issue aside, I just think consistently the board has required a minimum of two-foot contour interval. And I don't see any compelling reason why this application should be an exception, an exception to that. There's no hardship in terms of uh, capability. Um, there's nothing about the site that's either purely flat or non-wetland or anything else that uh, would, would make that a, a easily waivable requirement. Uh, I guess just from my own, my own opinion, with, with, with the road area or the area of alteration being shown in contour, along with uh, we can require the design page of the septic system to be done, which would show slope. Mm -hmm. That covers 90 percent of, of my concerns for this site. I, I fully understand. We're looking at everything, and all of the terms would be a subdivision, minor subdivision, but for legal reasons, it's not a subdivision. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to come to a point of reasonableness here to not hold up for a, a long time. Well, I, don't, I don't think we need to hold the applicant up. We find the application complete that they have provided topography. I've, I've already said that I'm willing to do that. And when we get to the substantive review of the information that's provided us, then if we require additional information, we can ask for it at that point. Uh, I, I didn't understand. Yeah, I, I thought you were holding on to the issue that it was a matter of complete. Sorry. No. But I, I do want it on the record that I will be looking for additional mm -hmm. topo information. Okay. John, let me back up to A. Did you indicate that the applicant would be submitting uh, more information on the HHE 200s or not? Our position is that <coughs> uh, for at least at this point, for completeness, we don't feel it's appropriate. No, there's no, I don't think there's any question about that, but we will be perhaps asking you for more specific information with respect to slope and whatnot. And perhaps full HHE -E perhaps. I, I think the issue is a matter of completeness. No, it, it's not not a requirement. They have submitted something uh, as far as the qualitative nature of it. Yes, if it gets to lot five, and I want to make sure that the the the, the uh, septic system is downgrading of the vernal pool, that's the one we want. I want yep. detail of that one site. Uh, do I want it on all of them? No, not necessarily. Uh, and I think that's the way to approach it. Just for a point of clarification, John, uh, for example, on lot uh, one, you show two, there are two rectangles shown uh, that connect two test pits, test pit one and two, and then test pit uh, five and seven. Both of those seem to be on the property line. There's not even a minimum 10-foot uh, yeah. setback there. Is there any in 
implication in, in the plan that those may be the the only sites available on that lot because <coughs> it doesn't appear that every test pit necessarily is, is going to meet a requirement for a septic system in right. case first of all uh, Tom the, the graphic symbol of these are much larger than what would actually be built at, for on-site disposal uh -huh. systems um, to answer your question whether there are other sites I don't know I don't know, uh, but we would certainly adhere to all setback requirements and slope requirements and for the That's final fine. design of these. Okay. Um, where are we with respect to F? The applicant has requested a waiver of the high-intensity soils evaluation. Are we willing to waive that Tom do you want to comment on that as well, well I, I don't have an issue I think if they've shown the hydric soils and they've and they're identifying uh, uh, sites for septic they've hit the uh, critical issues with respect to soils for the site any other comment on that okay uh, what about H town engineers notice that the flow direction of some drainage courses has not been provided Yeah, I, I guess what he intended, uh, well, what he meant was that he wanted directions of flow. Is that correct? That's what I understood. Yeah. Uh, I have not got any, any arrows indicating direction of flows. However, this shows a detailed grading plan, <coughs> uh, which shows slopes and swales and direction of flow without the arrows. Um, I, I did notice on one of his comments that he misinterpreted uh, some of the contouring on sheet two, uh, on page three of item 10, mm -hmm. uh, where he talks about the grading plan and, and ditch and slopes. Right. Uh, he said that the grading plan indicates that the ditch is on the south side of the proposed road, which is true. Consequently, these imply that the surface runoff from the roadway would sheet flow in a southerly direction, and that that's not so. Um, we have a ditch on the south side of the roadway, yeah. and it, the purpose is to pick up the sheet flow coming down off the steep slope, ah. direct it to the catch basins. I, I think he misinterpreted uh, mm -hmm. uh, some of the grading. Um, Be helped by the arrows, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's the arrows that. Uh... <clears throat> How do people feel about that as a completeness issue? I think it's complete. Right. I, I think in the issue again, you know. Mm -hmm. It's, this, there's something there that needs to be the, the board has all kinds of authority to go back and say we want an arrow on every single line if that's what we want uh, once we once we start I guess at this point in time as far as completeness no it's not an issue okay. I guess I'd like to say with for as a point of clarification that we don't have to accept just anything as a, a minimum requirement but I haven't seen anything so far that is a difficulty on the completeness side um, what about I? A waiver of a full stormwater report has been requested. This is supported by the town engineer. Is that acceptable to the board? Yes. Hearing no comment, I assume so. Um, J is ah the delineation of the port portion of the lot that is billable and the proposed footprints. Um, we have typically accepted a building envelope. Is that acceptable to the board without a building footprint? Uh, I guess the only question I have is that in the one case they've shown driveway access to uh, lot five, but they haven't shown any other driveway access to the other lots. And it's not clear to me necessarily that lot one, for example, might be accessed directly from uh, Cantor Lane or whether it might require additional wetland crossing or. Uh, some other method. 
And as far as I'm concerned, it's complete. It's, it's just a question I would have in review of the plans, what the intent is. Mm -hmm. There is no issue with respect to K. On M, town engineers noted that the applicant has proposed mitigating the access way construction with plantings, but we have no detail. Mm -hmm. We do have a detail with respect to the pond, but not with respect to the um, mitigation on the road itself. Any comment on that? Yeah, I, I have the uh, I have a, a question. I, it may be uh, actually a review question, not an issue of completeness. The question is, what other alternative uh, locations were considered? You know, before we even get into a mitigation measure. Uh, alternative location for the road itself. The road itself. And I would. But I think I'd that is that is not a completion issue. No, it's not a completion issue. It's a review issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Any other comments on M? Okay, N, the evidence of uh, DEP and Army Corps permits. N requires, ah, additional information required by the town planner. Um, what's the story on the DEP uh, request for permits? Mr. We have, <clears throat> we've had uh, discussions with DEP, um, and it will require, the way the proposal stands right now, will require a Tier 1 review, and uh, we intend to submit that application uh, as we go forward. What about Army Corps? Army Corps will be reviewed at the simultaneously with the EP. Okay. And with respect to P, are people satisfied with the uh, state of the legal Evidence of right title and interest. I, have, I just have a question with respect. It's not a completeness question, but it's a question to, to the applicant with regarding uh, tier one review. Mm -hmm. If uh, the request by the uh, police chief is met by increasing the width of the road from 12 feet, do you then uh, exceed tier one review? By the fire chief? By the fire chief. Um, it's going to be very close time. It, it, if we are required to uh, follow his recommendations to go to 18 feet. Yes, we will be into tier two. Okay. <clears throat> With that road alignment as is. With this road alignment, yeah. yes. <clears throat> okay. Um, according to my review of the each of the items raised, I don't understand that we have a completeness issue. We didn't totally decide about the H, the flow direction, uh, but I don't think that there is any other completeness issue that's raised. Is that a correct understanding on behalf of the board? That's correct. It's a level of information, mm -hmm. but not a completeness okay. issue. <laughs> do I hear, do we uh, uh, yes. While we're going down the list of level of information, uh, John, there's a vernal pool indicated in the uh, lower right-hand corner of the uh, parcel. Um, I know that vernal pools have some sphere of influence that may or may not uh, affect the regulatory uh, requirement at the state or federal level. Uh, you show a 25-foot setback. Is there any additional, have you done any work that shows the habitat area or the area that's influenced by that vernal pool? And is there indeed... There's nothing that... Maureen was, was very kind in providing uh, a lot of documentation from both the EP and Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. We went through that and could not find any uh, regulations that are, that are on the books right now that regulated... Uh, vernal pools. There was a number of recommendations and suggestions by Inland Fisheries and Wildlife, but they have not been adopted yet. 
Uh, right now, they're considered wetlands, and all of the guidelines and uh, regulations uh, for wetlands would be adhered to. Uh, that's why we showed a 25-foot setback. I mean, a uh, yeah, 25-foot setback around the Grand Pool. And we also indicated in the application that we would be willing to incorporate as a deed restriction to protect that vernal pool okay. in the development of that lot. The, the issue, as I'm sure you're aware, is not the location of the pool, but the area around which the pool is, right. is uh, the habitat that surrounds the pool. <clears throat> okay. Do I hear a motion with respect to completeness? What if I could find one? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I'm not sure I got it, actually. I don't think it's not disappeared. Yeah, that's a public act. We got a blank page there. Uh, our page that's is blank it, where it, we it. normally have a, a motion. Okay. Motion uh, <laughs> for the board to consider. Be it ordered that, based on the plans and materials submitted, the request of Shorewoods Incorporated, Incorporated Sangamon Associates Incorporated and Canter Corp for a wetland alteration permit and public access waiver for Canter Lane project, including lots 1, 4, and 5 in the area of Canter Lane, be deemed complete. Do I hear a second? I'll second. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor, raise your right hand. Unanimous. Now, Mr. Mitchell, the I note that it is 8:30. Uh, technically speaking, the board has the possibility of continuing to discuss the public access waiver and to um, begin the substantive review of the application. I don't know what the board's pleasure is at this point. Uh, we also need to schedule a public hearing on the wetlands alteration permit for next time and we need to see if any there's anybody's interested in the site walk although again the snow may impede that for the next uh, 30 days so um, is there any sense of wanting to start the substantive review process tonight or perhaps put that off until next time Mr. Edsel it would be my comment that um, that we not proceed to substantive review tonight, but in order to aid the, the applicant, if we have things pending on our mind that we know that we're going to talk about, to give them the benefit of the doubt and let them know that this is what would be, you know, each board member, if we have things that we want, you know, a little heads up on the direction that we're going, we let them know so we don't blindside them a month from now uh, with new items. Uh, not that that would be the limit of what we may want to discuss, but just to give you some idea. Um, and that we have another motion to, to uh, schedule a public hearing. You know, maybe we can just go through the board mm -hmm. in general, give you a heads up as what things we're looking for. Do you want to start with the heads up? Um, <laughs> if I can find my head, I'd start with the heads up. Um, I guess in general, the, the, the key thing, I'll go straight to the vernal pool. Um, Concerns that I have is, is, is I have a lot of concerns for a lot of the wetlands issues, but there are things characteristic of most wetlands that can be replaced and habitats change and so forth. The characteristic of a vernal pool is it, it simply can't be replaced. It's, it's, a, it's a phenomenon as much as it is as an environment. I will be looking personally as one board member to certainly expand that area of non-disturbance more than 25 feet. Um, I will ask that there be no um, uh, subsurface septic treatment plant upgrading of that. You have a location that is below gradient, I believe. It shows in a five-foot contour that it's at the same elevation, and that's where some, some two-foot contour would help. I'm simply looking to protect that, that more. I probably would ask for at least um, a copy of, of any um, legal language that you would add to a deed restriction as to um, what would be recorded as, as protection, not only in, in the plan. Um, 
yeah, I'd like to have a thousand foot setback, but that's not reasonable. <laughs> uh, I think it's a case of coming to compromise. I'm, I'm looking at 100 feet and maybe 50 feet. I think what you need to try to convince me of is whatever you set that at more than 25 feet will fully protect the function of, of that function that okay. takes place at a okay. pool. Um, there is a, a septic system that sits on uh, a boundary line. I, I think something needs to be done about, about that. Um, I will be looking um, at, even though we, we came, to, to, came to terms with, with the fire chief, is understanding his point of view on, on widening the road, maybe a compromise there where straight stretches uh, are treated slightly different than, than uh, curved section of the road. Um, there are certainly areas uh, at the intersection of the access road that need to be improved for turning radius of, of emergency vehicles. Uh, I guess in general those are the two or three areas that I'll be looking at. Mr. Wilcox, do you have anything specific to um, suggest? Uh, one of the things which I think I would like to see clarified in the application is the first uh, few hundred feet in from Route 77 right at this point uh, seems to be uh, omitted from the application. Uh, perhaps a uh, more detail of what's there now and how it relates to the public access waiver standards I think would be appropriate to see. Uh, and also the, um, uh, if there are uh, intermittent streams that have setback requirements on the property, the wetlands report referred to what they called 100 foot setback streams. Uh, it would be helpful in evaluating uh, the proposed uh, uses of the lots to see where those are. Thank you. Thank you. We need to wait for Mr. Emery, do you have any further comments? Uh, just a couple of uh, comments. I'll be looking for uh, alternative road scenarios. I was not at, <coughs> excuse me, I was not at the workshop that was presented at that uh, look, uh, meeting. I, I apologize, but I, I haven't seen or, or heard that discussion. Um, <coughs> the, uh, I, is there a dead end road uh, issue uh, with respect to the uh, standards? The the uh, new the proposed road is 760 feet, John, or thereabouts. Yes. And it's I'm not sure what it is. It's 700 feet to the intersection, plus or minus. And then how far from the intersection to 77? And uh, the road is 760 feet to the very end of the turnaround. <laughs> Oh, that's right. That's the dead end road restriction is in the subdivision ordinance, and this is not getting subdivision review. Still issues of all public roads uh, health and welfare. Yeah. You know, that, that come under that. Standard is 1,500 feet? 1,000 1, and 2,000. One or 2,000? 1,000, one, you can design a road that meets standards if it goes between 1,000 and 2,000. The entire road has to be 24 feet wide. Utilities have to be underground. It has to be 50 foot wider right of way dedicated. Uh, another question, and it's just a matter of, of uh, since we're we're not approving a subdivision, obviously, but we're approving a plan that may be recorded, and and I think for things to be consistent throughout the plan. One is the issue of the wetland mitigation that you're asking us on the existing pond to approve. It appears that that pond is excavated into the 40-foot right-of-way. And if one of the scenarios, scenarios is that you now have access via 40-foot right-of-way, but you've elected not to use that because it um, crosses a more sensitive area of the wetland, uh, I just, for the record, wouldn't want to have any issues with respect to additional um, easement requirements for construction of the pond or whatever. Essentially, if it was, if it was on... Um, Lot two's property, then it appears to have to have gone beyond the property line, and it may require an easement. Uh, the lot configurations. Uh, everyone who's on the board knows my my uh, opinion on that, uh, and and I assume that was discussed at the the workshop, but uh, is not something that we're necessarily reviewing this evening. Um, <coughs> And that's that's it. Plus the discussions on uh, the contour interval. Mr. Carlson. I'm fine, thank you. 
I have no further comments um, other than what has been, except that I wanted to make absolutely sure which pond it was that we were talking about mitigating. Is it the, it's that one, okay, yes. to the right of, okay. Uh, okay, is there any interest, well, so let's, uh, we will, is there any interest in having a site walk soon, or shall we simply um, schedule a public hearing for the next meeting? I would say, say we uh, take a look at snow cover from 30 days. And, yeah, there would, <laughs> Come back and revisit in, Unless the there's a, uh, a trail that's been uh, plowed in there or something, or, or we have snowshoes, there's really no way of walking that site. The snow's three feet deep. It's bad enough on your front yard. I can't imagine what it's like here. Is that a fair assumption? <laughs> One at a time. Just for your information, the center line of the roadway, proposed roadway, is flagged. Is flagged? Is flagged, yes. Okay. For snowshoes. Okay, shall we um, table the application until the re next regular Would you like a motion? Yes. Thank you. Excuse so, me, Madam you Chairman. Yes. Uh, could I just... Uh, maybe get a, a general sense of the board's feeling on the road width that we're proposing versus what the fire chief is asking for. Uh, th th that probably is, more than anything else, is, is really important to the applicants um, because they're, they're really trying to achieve a feel of this neighborhood um, being con staying consistent with the existing character of the neighborhood, which is narrow roadways, vegetation right up next to the sides of the, the road, canopy of trees over the roadway. Um, I mean, that's, that's the type of feel that they're trying to create. It's more like the neighborhood that you find over an Oakhurst section <laughs> um, with the narrow roadways um, versus the feel that you have when you drive into Stonegate. <clears throat> and it's very important to them, and that's why it would be um, nice to get a sense of the, what the board feels on that. How wide is Cantor Lane? Cantor Lane is 12 feet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's a fair question. Uh, anybody want to comment on it? Mr. Mr. Chair, I'll take a shot. Uh, in my relatively few years on the board, I think the narrowest one we've seen is 14 feet. And I would imagine the roads in Oakhurst are even wider than that. Uh, and that 14-footer we saw was went to one lot only. Mm -hmm. uh, this lot, this road uh, may serve driveways uh, for three lots, generating the need for oncoming traffic passing each other with turnouts or places to pull over. And I think that the, um, I think we in, in all likelihood traveled down a road a month or so ago uh, on the fire truck, which probably was designated as a 12 foot road, but as it went around curves and had uh, just sort of had uh, topography to deal with actually ended up being only 10 in a few places and the fire truck goes up over and, and has a problem with that. So uh, I think that in combination with maneuvering those corners with emergency vehicles uh, is going to be something that's going to seriously need to be addressed. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hesley? I, I think um, uh, I alluded to it before, a straight stretch is a road. Phantom, road, Phantom Farm Road is, is a road that we went on, and I don't remember the, the name, uh, the, the width of that, uh, and we were in the, the ladder truck. And, and prior to that, and, and part of the discussion we had at the workshop, you know, you, the tone of the board was, you know, we're not going to design the town around uh, town equipment. Well, to a certain extent, we were softened by, by a good um, um, exercise of, of, of having a chance to, to ride in that and to really see what and, and why that, that piece of equipment has to go to most sites, uh, including the, the homes in, in this location. Um, I, I think what that, uh, in a straight stretch of road, a 12 to 14 foot wide road is, is sufficient. 
Um, it's less than sufficient in, in when you have um, five and six foot snow banks, but um, that only happens a certain number of times a, a decade. Um, the key issues are where you have um, a turning radius in excess of uh, or less than a certain amount, and I don't, I don't know what that is. I, I know that there's going to be a requirement at, at the intersection that that be widened. I, I think if you can come to a creative solution where perhaps you narrow it down to a compromise of 14 feet in straight stretches and, and actually increase the width of the road um, at certain turning radius, turn radii um, to the 18 feet. I think 18 feet, um, the piece of equipment tracks pretty well through fairly tight um, radii. But, yeah, it, that doesn't answer your question, Phil, but I, it, it Is it customary that the, uh, the ladder truck um, would travel to a, a neighborhood like this? Mm. It is. We didn't understand that, but I mean, if it was chimney fires, for instance, it's the best piece of, of equipment. It is, it is the support vehicle. Uh, that, that's where all of the support equipment is carried in that, for some reason. Uh, and uh, not only is that how they reach two and a half story homes from driveways uh, for safety issues, going up the ladder versus standing a ladder up against the house, going up the roof ladder and, and so forth. It's a matter of safety uh, for the firefighters and a, a matter of speed to get to the chimney. Uh, we didn't realize that when we last talked to you at the workshop. Um, I think we were swayed somewhat. Uh, uh, I, I think maybe you sit down with, with Bill McGoldrick and, or Chief, uh, Fire Chief and, and, and say, where can we, you know, here's the straight stretch. Is it, do you think 14 feet or 12 feet will suffice here? What do we have to go to here as a maximum? Uh, I, I w I'm not one to say that it's got to be an 18-foot driveway, the full length of it. No, I just think there are certain sections where 14 feet will suffice. John, my impression from the uh, trip was that uh, 18 feet is maybe excessive, that uh, the reason he's requesting 18 feet is so that he can put out the uh, stabilizers. Um, but uh, 14 feet would seem to be a number that uh, we discussed quite a bit, and we're not going to say that's the final number, but I will say that it's probably going to be more than 12 feet. Uh, in addition, uh, a stabilized shoulder, a gravel shoulder, is something that uh, has been discussed. A, a shoulder that would be uh, gravel underneath with, with grass on top. That's what we're proposing. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, I'm sorry, Tom, to interrupt, but it's the, the cut uh, and slope, you know, he showed us instances where it, it may have been 14, 15, 16 feet wide, but there was an abrupt uh, cut into the slope. The truck rode up on that. You know, normally he could go out on the shoulder uh, where there's a slope there or a tree or a large rock. It just doesn't work. The other thing we didn't understand was height. I can't remember whether it's 10 and a half feet, 11 feet. Uh, the thing just doesn't get underneath all it. You know. the, un the unusual part, it's not as tall as most ladder trucks, but the unusual part of it is that it has, the ladder has a, a hose connection at the very front that overhangs the front of the truck be beyond the uh, front bumper by some uh, distance. Mm -hmm. So when he exits driveways or roadways and takes a right turn, uh, where he has to swing into the opposing lane, which we don't mind doing because it's an emergency basis, he often has more trouble clearing the trees beyond. The tree clearing limit is most critical around the intersections and on curves than actually the road, road width in some cases. So I think if you were to sit down with him and, and uh, work through a, a couple of scenarios, perhaps, in terms of width, uh, th that would seem to be the sort of custom design the road to to meet the, meet the equipment. The other unusual part about that equipment is it carries a lot of the uh, uh, support stuff for the fire uh, fighters. They tend to load that since it's a new piece of equipment. It has a lot of the other firefighting equipment that they need. Well, yeah, a lot's been said. I, I think it's going to be more than what footage you're, you're, you're expecting to get to 12 feet. The other thing, an emergency vehicle, be it an ambulance or a fire truck, a speed is very important. Timing is important rather than speed and getting there. If the driver has to stop and manipulate around certain things, that's, that's bad at the other end. So I don't think, I think 18 feet is a little bit too much, but 16 feet and then also some consideration of the vegetation that's around it. Yes. Yep. Last but not least, I guess I would just say, and I know that the other board members will, will 
uh, support this to some extent anyway, that, that we still do care about aesthetics and we don't want to try to make roads any larger than they actually have to be. So we are interested in trying to maintain the minimum length that's acceptable under safety standards. And I guess you've heard enough to know that we're right. sort of in the middle range between 12 and 18 here. Yep. So, okay. May I have a motion for Mr. Emery? I have a motion that be it ordered that uh, the application be tabled to the regular February 20th, 1996 meeting of the Planning Board, at which time a public hearing shall be held. Second that motion. Public hearing with respect to, this, to the wetlands alteration permit. That's correct. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Edsel. Any further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Next item on the agenda is Dominicus Crossing, request by, I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm sure, NAPIC, Land Associates for Preliminary Subdivision Approval and a Wetlands Alteration Permit for a 96 lot and one unit subdivision located off Wells and Sawyer Roads, Section 16-2-4, Completeness, and Section 19-3-9, Completeness. Maureen, would you give us a brief introduction on this? Sure, this is a project that the board has seen in workshop five previous occasions. It's a 200 plus acre site on Wells Road and Sawyer Road. Uh, the applicant is proposing a single family subdivision in the three phases. Uh, we had some discussions about exactly how many lots and how many units are involved and, and the applicant is still discussing with the code officer the status of one of the multifamily units, whether or not it has to go to the zoning board first, and we're expecting that to be resolved very, very quickly, I assume. Um, what the board is being asked to do tonight is, this is a major subdivision, so it has a preliminary subdivision review and a final subdivision review. In addition, there are substantial wetlands on the site, and the applicant will be crossing wetlands at several locations, primarily for, for roads. 
Uh, so at the tonight's meeting, the board is asked to look again at completeness for preliminary subdivision review and also completeness for a wetlands alteration permit. If the board deems the application complete tonight, um, a public hearing would be scheduled for February. If the application is not deemed complete tonight, the board would need to convey a good sense of what is needed to make the application complete, and the applicant would have four months to make the application complete, or it would be considered withdrawn. Are there any questions? I have a question. Maureen, does this application come under the subdivision uh, regulation um, that we just received effective uh, with amendments 11096 or the one prior to that? Uh, my expectation is it would come under the one prior to that. However, you can use the most current one in front of you because the only change to the most current one is the open space impact fee. Okay. So with the exception of that one there no section, there are no other changes. So uh, I would just keep the most current one, <laughs> use that as a reference, and keep in mind that this applicant is required to make 10 percent of the development available for recreation and then also preserve natural features any subdivisions that come in after um, i believe it was january 11th um, janet's looking at me and no. the more i think about it yes this app this application would come in under the new subdivision regulations because it, it hasn't been deemed complete yet correct mm. I'm, I stand corrected. <coughs> Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, Mr. Before you proceed uh, further with the issue of completeness, um, I mentioned during the, uh, when I was chairman earlier in the evening, uh, that there was an issue that had to be addressed with respect to correspondence that was on the table. Uh, the Planning Board has received a letter uh, dated January 9th, 1996, addressed to Maureen and members of the Planning Board. It's uh, from Susie Terrian, uh, Director Butter to the property. A <coughs> uh, comment, uh, first of all, in the first paragraph, she states that I have been a witness to thoughtful scrutiny uh, that the plans have received from the Planning Board from preliminary through substantive review. This is with respect to our workshop meetings. Uh, for the record, before we proceed with anything, I'd like to state that there has been no substantive review of the project because it uh, has not been before the board in any uh, thing other than workshop and an informal site walk. Um, more critical to the issue is that uh, she goes on to state at the uh, toward the end of the second paragraph that my letter, uh, this is uh, with respect uh, uh, to a letter uh, regarding uh, the access road. Um, my letter pointed out that a study conducted by David Camilla of Land Use Consultants at my expense showed that the original entrance adjacent to Mr. Prez's home conforms to the site distance requirement. Uh, as I stated earlier, uh, I, had, I have moved uh, from Terrian Architects to uh, uh, Land Use Consultants. Uh, that move <coughs> took place uh, about December 17th. It's my understanding that uh, David Camillo of Land Use Consultants was contracted uh, prior to that date. Um, so I don't see that there's a direct conflict of interest, nor do I understand that there's an ongoing working relationship uh, between Land Use Consultants and the abutter, so I don't see that there's a conflict of interest uh, there. Uh, thirdly, uh, for the record, uh, I, had had, I have expressed concerns about the location of the access road prior to uh, Susie Terry in contacting um, David Camilla, so I don't want any discussion down the, uh, further down to be seen as a direct relationship between uh, her discussions with David Camilla and land use consultants. So I don't, I don't see a, a direct conflict of this time. Should for any reason uh, uh, Susie Terry and elect to continue uh, services with David Camilla or land use consultants, of course, I will recuse myself from any uh, consideration of the project. Thank you. Thank you. Um, would the applicant like to make a reasonably short presentation, maybe limited to maybe 20 minutes? We'll try. Okay. My name is Terry Dewan. I'm a landscape architect in Yarmouth. And with me is Lester Berry of BH2M in Gorham, the civil engineers for the project. Um, this, as you know, is a very lengthy application. Uh, we've been before the board at your grace for the last 
several months. Uh, it's been very helpful coming before the board and talking with you informally, trying to address very specific issues related to affordable housing, density, wetlands, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that as a result of those discussions, which have proven to be very fruitful and enlightening in terms of dealing with the ordinance and the specifics of the site, we've been able to come back and present with you a, an application for the subdivision application and the wetlands alteration application which we feel at this point is very close to meeting the level of completeness. Uh, we've been working with Maureen and Fred and T.Y. Lynn over the last several weeks since we submitted the application. Uh, we know that there are a few, what we consider to be fairly minor uh, deficiencies in the application, um, some of which were inexcusable, uh, some of which were unavoidable, and we are prepared to submit the missing information probably in the next week or so. Uh, we do hope to be back before you uh, in February. Um, as you requested, we are prepared to make a very brief presentation. I know that you've heard a lot of the information discussed at times over the last several months. Uh, we do not feel that tonight is the night to make a very detailed, substantive presentation, but merely to bring you up to date as to how we've got to the point where we're at right now. Uh, we were told by Maureen that one of the comments that the town uh, public works department town engineer had was that we did not supply them with a drawing at 200 scale in other words one that showed the entire development of one piece of paper and so tonight we were co we come before you with a display showing uh, that information in several different formats we also have some information that les barry will talk about from uh, to give you an overview of the engineering uh, this information will be made available uh, to the town officials uh, for subsequent use in the, uh, the application review process. Uh, as Maureen may have mentioned to you, we are meeting with various department heads, February 6th is it, I believe. Uh, they will go over some of the comments that Fred has made to review some of the comments that we hear tonight uh, and to review any additional information that we have to offer. Um, with that in mind, uh, I would like to go through these series of three boards here. Uh, we do have a few more. Uh, we do have a larger plan which we have prepared for the Southerly entranceway, which I would like to use to talk about the discussion relative to the access road on the Wells Road. Uh, needless to say, there is a lot of information which we will not get to tonight, and please bear with me. If you have any detailed information that you need from us, please ask. If you have any questions uh, that we don't cover tonight, um, or feel free to uh, think of us as, as at your disposal. When we first started the work of the project, as you know, we, we had a detailed wetland inventory done by Richard Sweet of Sweet Associates. Um, we have subsequently had Woodlot Alternatives go back out on the site and prepare a function and values assessment as part of the application for the wetland alteration permit. Uh, initially, we felt that we were at about 48,000 square feet of wetland impact. Uh, subsequent to that calculation and in looking at some of the impacts that would result from the stormwater management uh, efforts uh, on the site, uh, we're now at 1.66 acres of wetland alteration. This does involve the, the application before the town. It's also a tier three or a full-blown NRPA application before the main DEP. It's also a category two application before the Army Corps of Engineers. We have met with uh, the DEP. We have walked with them on the site, both the site reviewer, who's Mary Beth Richardson. And we've also walked on the site with Dawn Hollowell, who is a NRPA specialist at DEP. Um, we've specifically looked at virtually every single crossing that we have identified It's part of your package, which is in section 11, I believe, uh, that Woodland Alternative did. Uh, they identified certain areas that they felt deserved a little bit more attention than others. And we've tried to address that in terms of the detail that we're offering you in terms of the function of values assessment. We've also uh, taken great pains, we feel, to address some of the mitigation measures that we're proposing for the site in terms of avoidance, preservation, uh, and other actions that will be made part of the application. Um, in terms of the status before the, the other regulatory agencies, we are still waiting for a couple of pieces of information relative to improvements to Jordan Pond, which Les Berry will talk to you about. Once we get that information, uh, we will be submitting the application for both site location of development permit 
and the NRPA application to DEP. We're hoping that that'll be within the next week. Um, we had a, our pre-submission conference with Mary Beth Richardson at DEP's Portland office last week. Uh, we've reviewed a, an information package almost as thick as the one that you have. Uh, she pointed out a couple of areas that we need additional information on, but she is primed to receive it. Uh, we expect that that process should go fairly smoothly, and hopefully it'll run on a parallel track with the application before the town. Uh, the, the plan that we've identified here uh, and my left, as I'm looking at the plan, identifies the various types of wetlands that are found on the site. Uh, the resource protection one wetland is this large one here, another one in the northern part of the site. These are wetlands in excess of two acres with very poorly drained soils. We also have resource protection one wetlands in one to two acre categories, which are the other green areas on the site. Both of these, of course, require a buffer zone around them, 250 foot buffer zone around both of the larger wetlands, uh, the RP1 uh, areas, and then uh, for the areas around the RP1 that are between one and two acres, this area down here, down here, and up here, we're showing a 100 foot buffer. Um, if you recall, we had a lot of discussion subsequent to coming before the board as to whether or not any of the lots should include any of the buffer zone. And it was the, the sentiment on the part of Maureen, certainly, and the planning board echoed it, if at all possible, uh, we should exclude any of these buffer zones from the lot area. And what we've tried to, what we've done here is indicate by black line the extent of the land that's going to be uh, developed as part of the open space or the separation between the open space on one side of the line and the lot areas on the other side of the line. And you'll see that virtually everywhere on the site, all the RP1 um, and the buffer zones around the RP1 uh, the 250 and the 100 foot uh, setbacks are within uh, this land that will be preserved as part of the, uh, the open space preservation system. Uh, we've also indicated on this plan in these red areas the wetlands that we're applying for the wetland alteration permit, again before the local, state, and the federal agencies. Um, if you haven't had a chance to look at section 11, each one of these has been identified. There has been a, an attempt made by Willow Alternatives to identify the functions and values of the wetlands that are out there. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of information that if you're interested in going into that uh, level of detail, uh, we probably could have um, Josh Reut uh, or John Lordy, the authors of the report from Willow Alternatives, come before the planning board and discuss that in detail. Uh, that's a question that I just leave as an open issue right now. Uh, do you want to get into that level of detail with those consultants, or is that something which we should be handling uh, at a staff level with Maureen and Fred? But they certainly are available. There is a wealth of information which they have 